again, welcome to the State of Online Learning in Oklahoma 2022. This is an annual presentation that we do for our Oklahoma Learning Innovation Summit as a kickoff. So welcome. Uh, we're very pleased to have you here for this year's event, which is taking place in the new Zoom events platform. Uh, so again, we're going to get kicked off here with our plenary session today. Uh, and I hope that you'll be able to stick around for the rest of the day and check out some of the other sessions. Uh, we also have a wonderful expo event that's going to be happening during the lunch hour where you can find out about a couple of exciting projects that we have underway. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters for today. So my name is Brad Griffith and I work for the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education as the Director of Online Learning Initiatives. So I'm pretty much the liaison for everything online and micro-credential related for our state system right now. Uh, I'm also joined by Joy Bauer, who is our Online Consortium of Oklahoma Chair for 2021-22. Uh, she comes from Northeastern Oklahoma A&M College. Uh, so thank you, Joy, very much for being here today. Uh, we'll hear from Joy for OCO updates here shortly. Uh, also joined by Mr. Brett King from the University of Central Oklahoma, who is right now serving as our Council for Online Learning Excellence Chair uh, for this academic year 21-22. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Dana Linden Burgett, who works very closely with myself uh, as the lead quality matters coordinator for our system subscription, which is now up to 25 member institutions. Uh, and Dana works primarily at Rose State College in Midwest City there. So um, the very first thing that we're going to do before we hear updates from all of our presenters here today is to actually turn it over to Brett to let us know who our winners are for the Oklahoma Online Excellence Awards this year. So uh, Brett, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll cycle through these slides if you wanna reveal our winners here today. Yeah, sure, so I'll follow, I'll follow your lead on the slides. <laughs> Yeah, so for accessibility, this is particularly particularly exciting because this is our newest award for this year. Um, and so we are celebrating Oklahoma State University with Christina, help me pronounce that last name? Calhoun. Yeah, Calhoun. Uh, so we're excited to, to give out this award and honestly, just to kick it off to be our, our first award for accessibility. And particularly exciting, obviously coming from UCO, for teaching, we want to celebrate Abby Lambert Botts um, for the teaching award. And for individual leadership, Melanie Reinhardt for Seminole State College. And for team leadership, we're going to go with the Oklahoma Teacher Connection from the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. And from UCO, the IDEA team uh, for innovation. Thank you very much, Brett. <clears throat> and again, I realize that that's a very short readout, obviously, of our Online Excellence Award winners. They will receive full recognition at the April 28th State Regents Meeting, which will take place at OSU in Stillwater in person this year. Uh, we're very fortunate to be able to recognize our winners in person. Uh, we were not able to do so last year. We had to do it completely over Zoom there. So uh, thank you very much. And again, you will be hearing more information about those individual winners if you have a chance to tune in to that state regents meeting on april 28th there so um brett thank you again very much for reading those off that is an award series that is also coordinated by our members from cole our council for online learning excellence and they are selected by peers from our own institution so very excited to present those to the winners this year um, now we have a little bit of change of course here to discuss some online learning trends that have taken place uh, over the last year of data that we have actually collected. For those that are not familiar with the way that data is coordinated at the state level between our higher education institutions, the state regions actually manages a system called the unitary data system where we collect data on course completion, success rates, graduation, students, everything from our institutions. Uh, so that is really the uh, data set that you're getting be stinged here, uh, what we pulled it from today. Um, this data set is from 2020-21. So we're a year back, obviously, on the data that we're able to access here. Um, so I just want you to keep that in mind that this is not what is happening in the current year right now. We're looking at one year, uh, one year back. 
So before we get into some numbers and stats here, I do ask everybody to kind of take a moment to pause and reflect on the last year. Uh, obviously, in March of 2020, that was really when the great remote shift came upon us. Um, you know, we had a lot of leaps and bounds that had to be gone through at that time, uh, really stretching ourselves and pivoting every single which direction presented itself to us along the way. Uh, but I think during this previous year, we've seen things kind of iron out a little bit more. Uh, we're still addressing things that are unusual and emerging as they come to us, but uh, realizing, I think, that we have the strength and, you know, the innovation, the ingenuity within our system and our colleagues that we have around us to be able to kind of meet the task and meet the needs that our students have, uh, which are ever evolving these days. So again, just a couple of things to consider here that the Great Pivot has actually brought to us. We have new online learners. There are many students that are going through distance education courses now that would not have made that decision otherwise had they not perhaps been forced into it because of the pandemic. Um, you know, there, there are many new students out there that, again, were not necessarily this type of learner that would have picked that course on their own. Uh, but that has changed for many individuals because of the experiences that they've had, uh, seeing perhaps that going into an online course that they do have what it takes uh, and that there can be some advantages gain to their lifestyle as a student uh, by even incorporating one or two online courses into their schedule. Along with that, obviously, we've welcomed new online faculty, uh, not only those who may have been resistant to teaching in the online environment uh, because of personal preference, or perhaps because they were in a discipline area that is not entirely conducive to online education. Uh, but we, again, were challenged continuously, I think, beginning in March of 2020 and following into the subsequent academic year. Uh, and again, many people have seen the advantages and the possibilities, the promises that can come, you know, with using online education modalities. Along those lines, we've also had new programs. Uh, again, if you think about like fine arts, for example, all of those courses had to transition in some way to a remote capacity during this great shift. Uh, and there are lessons that have been learned, advantages that have been recognized out of that situation uh, that we can actually take and incorporate into our practices moving ahead. And again, along with that new modalities, we saw many faculty out there trying things like HyFlex or synchronous online courses where you create that live in-person community without the physical environment actually being present there. Uh, again, many people thinking outside of the box to come up with community and collaboration here. Along with that, new policies, uh, you know, making it possible for programs to pivot quickly to distance education without having to go through approval processes. Uh, we did also bring in other flexibilities for students like pass and no pass grading accommodations during this time, uh, which again address temporary things, but I think have also provided us with insights that are going to last well beyond just this emergency circumstance of the pandemic. And again, what I would just ask everybody to consider is that we now have this future, I think, with an enhanced recognition of distance learning opportunities to where we don't have any institutions that are online or not online institutions uh, anymore or colleges or universities. Every institution is an online institution and has that capacity to serve their students at a distance now, uh, which I think is a wonderful thing. So let's get into some hard numbers here, which I think are always interesting. How have our students performed? How has our system performed concerning online education? Uh, and again, taking with a big grain of salt that there were some flexibilities offered to students and institutions concerning policies such as grading, uh, modalities of the courses, everything along with that, uh, you're going to see some interesting comparative numbers here today. So the data set that we have that you're seeing on the left-hand side right now is the old one that we have from last year, which is 2019-20. Uh, I will say that I think that that is going to be kind of a breaking point as we look at these trends over the next couple of years and see how this great pandemic, the great pivot uh, shift that we've gone through actually irons out, you know, with student habits and the choices that they make, uh, the successes that they have taking online courses. So in 2019-20, which is the last, I would say, stable or regular year of data that we have, 63% of all learners in our system took at least one online course. That number had trended upward 1% year over year since 2015. So again, we started, I think, at about 57% in 2015 and gained one percentage point each year uh, as we moved ahead into 2019 and 20. So as you look ahead into 2020 and 2021, Again, with that great shift, knowing that we had the pandemic under our hands, 
82% of learners within our system took at least one online course. That is a massive jump uh, from 63 to 82%. Uh, but again, indicates the investment in infrastructure that we have for online education for our students. So how did students perform in online courses versus face-to-face -face courses? In the prior year data, we had 84% success rate. So those earning credit in all course modalities, which included online combined with that, and if you extracted online or distance education from that, it was actually one point higher with 85% success rate or credit earned in courses that were taken. Looking ahead into 2020 and 2021, again, considering that we did have a policy that was enabled there for a period of time at the beginning of this academic year we're looking at, 93% of students did actually succeed in their online courses, both for face-to-face -face and for the online course modalities. So again, pretty significant jump there, but taking into account that there was some policy flexibility on grading included there. So how many uh, graduates took an online course or online courses during the entire year of study or course of study that they have? For associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees, we look at different uh, historical periods for this, but both of them were actually 99% <laughs> within the 2020 and 2021 academic year that took at least one online course there uh, within their six year or three year or six year period. So uh, again, this I think really indicates that online is here to stay. Online will have a presence in every single student's educational path when they're in the higher education system, regardless of what major or course of study it is that they're following. How were students retained from the 2019-20 year into the next fall year? So did they again come back to uh, or graduate or enroll in the subsequent semester? Uh, all students where you had the retention rate of 72% and those that were taking online courses or took at least one online course had a retention rate of 74%. So again, not too statistically different, you know, or that significance here being, uh, you know, large, but there is a little bit of an uptick we had for those taking an online course uh, concerning retention. Another common thing that we like to look at is which classifications included the most uh, or largest percentage of fully online learners. Uh, and I think those of you that work in online programs, this is not going to be such a surprise for you that our graduate master level students are those that are taking the most fully online uh, programs of study. Uh, we've seen massive growth, growth in these areas, you know, professionals looking to come back for graduate level coursework. Online really does work best for them in many ways, uh, you know, to meet the needs of their professional lives. Many of them have families. Uh, so I think that it's natural that we're going to continue to see this number kind of outrank the other programs. But again, if you do compare prior year data, nearly all of these have actually increased year over year. Uh, and I expect that to continue uh, as, again, we see this iron out over time. So that is all for the statistical update and throwing numbers at everybody for today. But I hope that you found, again, those trends to be interesting, uh, you know, and think about those as you go through your practices. Uh, you know, think about them as you ad observe activities at your institution uh, and obviously in your strategic planning practices for distance education. So, uh, Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you to give some updates from Cole uh, for our annual report here. Awesome. <clears throat> well, good morning, all. It is my distinct privilege to be able to stand here and, and give you the update from Cole. Um, as chair of, er, chair of Cole, I get the unique opportunity to interact with all the different committees and see all the great work that they do. But first and foremost, before I get started on that report, I want to give a huge thank you to Brad. Um, without his help and assistance, honestly, much of the work that we do could not be done. Uh, Brad, he mentioned earlier, is our liaison, but he's also our organizer. He is our reminder, our ideator, our collaborator on much of the projects that we do. Um, and if there's like a little, I think there is a reactions button in the chat for like clappy hands, you, you should probably get a lot of those, Brad, um, because we, we honestly would not be able to do the work that we do in these committees without your help. So thank you. All right, so let's go to the committees. Um, so currently we have six committees within COAL, Accessibility, Advanced Technologies, uh, Open Educational Re Resources, Policy, um, professional, de professional Development, 
and student success. Um, you know, I really want to mention here again, uh, this is the work of people doing their volunteering their time here. Um, we are not getting paid any additional stipends. We are not getting um, anything here except for doing the work of the state to try to improve the, the learning experiences for our students. We're trying to do professional development for our, our faculty who are involved in online learning. Um, so uh, this is my opportunity just to stand here and to say thank you to all those that are involved in different in the committees and especially the those that are chairing the committees. Okay, so let's kick off with some committee highlights. Um, and again, these are just highlights. This is not the the complete work of the complete work of all these committees, but this is just stuff that that we wanted to highlight here. Um, first, with Pamela Lauterbach chairing the Accessibility Committee. Um, I want to mention two things here that were distinctly impactful, I think, um, which is one, the new Online Excellence Award. This really establishes a criterion for excellence in the state when it comes to accessibility um, and the work of the committee to go through and create the criterion. Um, and then those that served on evaluating those criterion for the award, this sets a standard for excellence um, in the state. So. Uh, I wanted to point at that. And also a particular thing that I wanted to mention was the Executive Leadership Summit. So this was an opportunity for us to meet with leaders from across the state to talk about how we can improve accessibility in our state for online learning, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, um, and how we can collaborate with each other moving forward. And then one that I'm particularly excited about uh, to give a, an update on is student success. Um, so obviously over the last two years, student success retention and their overall health and wellness of our students has been uh, highlighted um, in some ways, in good ways and others in bad. We were discovering a lot of burnout. We were discovering a lot of people who were isolated in the environment. Um, it was the impetus why we wanted to create the student success group um, so that we could collaborate with people from across the state at different institutions um, to help them. So this group, you can see what they're working on right now, but there is a lot of good work being done by the chairs, Melanie Reinhardt and Jenny Maple um, for this group. Thanks to you to all those. Okay, so moving on to advanced technology. Um, this group, I feel like uh, you can see the highlights there, but I, I really did want to point out the virtual reality toolkits and the folks that are involved with, with sort of pioneering this. And one of those is Christilla Smith from, um, from Southeastern. Um, I, I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, much of the critical guidance, feedback, and examples has been provided by Southeastern. Um, and we've been able to see how these things actually are implemented in, in the classroom. Um, much of the work of the Advanced Technologies Group is in the effort of making advanced technologies and innovation accessible to all the different institutions and learners. So whether that be a division one school or a small community school, rural, rural schools, that's what the advanced technology group is charged to do is to make that accessible uh, to all these instructors so that all of our students can get um, these really engaging and innovative experiences across our institutions. Chairing that right now is Alicia Reidenhauer and Simon Ringsmith. Um, and Alicia's from South, uh, Southeastern and Simon from Oklahoma State University. So OER, Open Educational Resources, uh, this is one of our older, most established uh, coal groups. And it shows, if you look here at the work that's being done from the OER Summit, which has great participation, people talking about how to make education accessible and open across our state, um, from the digital badges that are offered um, and um, having the, uh, this is, I don't know how many grants they've had, but this is just the latest, the IMLS grant partnership. Um, in addition to leading examples, utilizing open, open educational platforms such as Pressbooks, um, we're seeing how this group is impacting our state um, and impacting the lives, lives of our students. Obviously, everything's getting more expensive and everything is getting, uh, college is getting more expensive, right? This group is charged with addressing that, with making education more open, more free, more collaborative amongst our faculty members being able to collaborate on platforms such as Pressbooks. So I wanted to thank the group for all the work that they're doing to make education more accessible here across the state. Um, uh, Kathy S. Miller from Oklahoma State University and Ann Raya from Oklahoma City Community College are chairing that now. 
Okay, and professional development. Um, I'm excited. So Lisa Friesen is the current chair for this committee, and you are seeing you're a benefactor of all the hard work that is being done on this committee right now. Um, you know, it takes, again, an immense amount of planning and work and collaboration uh, to come up with these sessions, to look over the presenters and everything else that comes with it. Um, all done, again, on a volunteer basis to organize um, the Oklahoma Learning Innovation Summit. Um, I think this group obviously is charged with doing this, but not only that, but also offering also offer a, offering professional development to to faculty and to our to our unit um, to call itself. Um, and so, I just wanted to take time to to thank Lisa and the rest of the committee members for putting this on. And Brad, I will turn it over or to you to take us to our next person. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, it's clear to see that Cole has been up to absolutely nothing over the last year, right? <laughs> no, it is, it's an absolute privilege, honestly, to be able to work with so many talented individuals from across our state. Uh, it's funny because we, I think in many cases, have never met each other in person, uh, mostly because of the pandemic being in there, but uh, it's just the nature of what we do. But that does not prevent us from being high productive, uh, you know, and getting projects out there at all. So uh, going to go ahead and turn it over to Joy Bauer. Joy, if you'd like to introduce yourself and provide us with some updates from OCO. Absolutely. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad, for the updates on coal. Um, good morning, I am Joy Bauer. It is my honor to serve as the 2021-22 chair for OCO. Um, our steering committee um, does have a broad reach with 25 members representing higher education institutions across the state. And I'm very pleased to present the work from this group in just the next few slides. And again, like Brett, I'm just, you know, this is just a surface level of uh, the much, much appreciated work that, that is going on across the state. Um, institutions along with members of our committee are listed here and I encourage you to become familiar with these individuals and be an active participant in the initiatives that are of interest to you as I share the projects that have been completed this year and the projects that are ongoing. Brad, I also invite you to chime in as we go through the next few slides um, and please contribute any additional information you would like to share. With support from these member institutions, the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education, as, Brett, or as Brad said in his opening address, we in Oklahoma have came a long way in supporting Oklahoma online learners and faculty who uh, are teaching those courses. One of our first initiatives um, that I'd like to showcase is our credly acclaimed pilot. Um, a digital badging system, you may be familiar with this, is being piloted to, uh, with support from the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. And as you can see, we currently have four badges available, three of them for specific to OER, one specific to Zoom, so that faculty and staff can showcase their earned credentials. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Credly through other organizations. Um, Okay, so next, our 2021-22 Institute on o Open Educational Resources. This, in, this is backed by AACNU and is a project that is partially complete with ongoing initiatives. Um, sincere thank you to our cohort members from institutions across the state. And you'll see that these institutions represent small, large uh, organizations, and a special thank you to our project lead, Mr. Brad Griffith. As one of the completed uh, goals for this year, our mission, our OER mission and vision statement was approved by Chancellor Johnson on October 5th, 2021. And, is, and it is in place to guide the work for this project. You're welcome to read over the, the mission and vision statement as approved. 
On the next slide, um, this project has yielded three published works, as, um, as you'll see here. And if you look at the bulleted item list, the title Boundless Statistics for Organization already has a documented cost savings of $10,000 for our students in only one semester. So this reiterates exactly what Brett was talking about previously. We look forward to reporting on the other three works that, that are outlined here as they are set in motion and are, as data becomes available, right, Brad? <laughs> on the next slide, um, I would just say if this OER project has sparked an interest with you, I'm very excited to share that the project grants that Brett alluded to are now available for development of zero cost textbooks to benefit our online learners. And you'll notice that uh, four credit courses are eligible. You've got a good window of opportunity up to 18 months to complete the project. And there are three funding levels um, available. And Brad, if you don't mind, at this time, I'd ask you to jump in and um, kind of further explain the details of each of these levels. Thank you, Joy. I would be happy to do so. So as you can see on the bottom bullet point right there, there are three funding levels available for these projects. The first one is of $500, and this is designated for whole adoptions of open educational resource textbooks. So this would mean that a faculty member would go and find a textbook that exists already, adopt it within the Pressbooks platform with minimal modification and near immediate use in their course, hence the lowest possible amount there. The middle category, which I think tends to be the most popular with faculty using OER, is $1,500 for remixing and revising of resources. Courses. So this, as Joy mentioned, we had a book that's called Boundless Statistics that was developed by myself and a couple of other faculty for a reach higher course on data analysis. We actually pulled one resource from Lumen Learning, another resource that was a Pressbooks text, and combined those and kind of mixed them together to match the learning objectives in our course. So it does require a bit more work, obviously, than the whole adoption there. Uh, but again, it's not quite as intensive as having to fully author a text. So naturally, leading into that third category there for the $2,500 amount grants, those are for fully authored works that are licensed with Creative Commons attributions and hosted in our Pressbooks platform. So uh, again, really great opportunities, no matter the scope of what it is that you're looking for uh, to provide this opportunity to utilize zero cost textbooks within your course through the Pressbooks platform. Uh, the other plug that I will give shamelessly is that we do have an expo space that will show up between 12 and 1 p.m. on each of the four Fridays of the summit. If you're interested in discussing more about these projects there, I will actually be sitting in that expo space for the majority of the lunch period and would love to discuss the course that you're working on right now and maybe explore how these possibilities could unfold uh, depending upon which option you may be interested in there. So again, very excited to actually be able to launch these grant funds specifically for this conference. Uh, this is something that's been a year or more actually in the works of getting all of the policies, the systems, the funding and everything actually lined out there. So uh, thank you, Joy, again, for that opportunity to chime in. Absolutely. Nothing better than hearing from one of the authors. <laughs> uh, firsthand experience. All right. Um, I have nothing further, so I will go ahead and um, look to get Dr. Dana Linden Bergette for our update on QM. Thank you, Joy. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate everybody listening. All the presentations have been good about the, um, the work that we're doing in our state. Um, I'm, I'm proud of Oklahoma and what we're contributing here. Um, so my portion really is to talk about how we're working with QM. Um, first of all, um, it, it, QM, if, I know we have many members that are overlapping because um, Brad mentioned we had 25 members, but for those that may not, uh, be as familiar with what QM does. Um, it is a global um, system. So it used to be just statewide or just um, international or just national, thank you. Um, and now they're um, 
they're global. They have a lot of international uh, school systems and stuff that use um, the QM rubric. They really focus on making it a faculty-driven peer review process. If you are interested in ever doing a fully um, uh, recognized peer review, you could do it through Quality Matters or even um, be an, uh, an independent um, review or a subscriber review. Um, the faculty reviewer, or all the reviewers will be faculty members. Um, and that all the reviewers will have online teaching experience. So there, it's, it's designed to give good feedback to those um, people um, submitting their courses for review. It is a research-driven process. Um, QM began in the research field and they continue in the research field. Every three years, the QM rubric is updated based on the latest research and they put that research on their website. Um, in fact, you can see the third bullet down for the multiple resources. Um, access to that research library is available on their main um, site and you do not have to be a member to look at that research. Even the QM rubric itself is available to the public off of their main site. You just don't get the workbook and the annotations if you're not a member. If you are a member, you can attend their success stories. We have a lot of faculty members across our state that attend those success story webinars. Those are free of charge. Um, we have uh, QM created an accessibility and usability resource site. It's available to any member, any faculty member that is part of the subscription can go on and use that site. It just helps for those faculty members that may be new to thinking about um, creating content that is accessible or usable. Um, but they've got lots of different workshops and they have an online teaching certificate program, a lot of different resources that are available to their members. Um, on the, um, as I was mentioning earlier, there are 25 Quality Matter affiliates. We have three new members. Um, Connor State College has joined, Oklahoma City Community College has joined recently, and the U University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma has recently joined. So those three new members help us round out to the top 25. Um, but um, uh, um, anyway, among these members, um, 43 courses have been certified, and these courses are certified um, through the official system. They may have been a subscriber review or QM review, but 43 courses in our state carry the QM um, seal uh, meeting the rubric expectations. We have also um, offered 252 um, dedicated workshop, well, actually not that many workshops, but those are the number of faculty that have completed a workshops, um, a workshop that we offer. 53 people completed the APPQMR, 86 did the IYOC, and 113 did the, did the DYOC, which kind of um, backs up what Brad said at the very beginning. We had a lot of people, um, faculty members that were new to online um, from the pandemic, uh, want to go back through that and think about how they want to design their course um, more in a more meaningful way considering the student's perspective. And then just, just to kind of kick this off just a tad bit to show you that cost savings, this is one reason why we do um, the statewide workshops and that's the benefit of being a system in QM and the, it's the cost savings that we can give back to the state overall. In addition to um, getting the nice blend of diversity in our workshops, because you have faculty from all over the state collaborating and sharing and giving ideas, there is a substantial savings. In this case, we want to be on the low side, okay? Because it's just cost related. So we saved over um, $24,000 by offering our statewide workshops. Um, and this is just the cost there for, for your view, but that's a, that's a major cost savings spread out among all of us. Um, 
And then I'd just like to kind of wrap it up with, uh, uh, let's see, the next slide. I just kind of want to wrap it up by sharing who all of our active facilitators are um, and sharing uh, about our upcoming workshop dates. We have created um, Emerge kind of out of trying to get everybody coordinated so that we could offer workshops on a consistent basis because we thought that that would help our members and our affiliates so that they could plan when the next workshop was coming. So we have um, the first week of April, we'll have all three of the workshops. We will also offer worksheet workshops the second week of July, um, the first week or the second week of September, and then the first week of October and November. And this hopefully will create a, a, a nice pattern to where it's predictable and to where it'll be really easy for our affiliates to fit in um, participants that, that want to do more as far as um, researching how they can make their courses even better, or even possibly um, taking the APPQMR, not only to learn more about the rubric, but to think about possibly becoming a peer reviewer. Dana, thank you so much for those quality matters updates. Uh, and I will just kind of echo again about your statement of seeing the increase of designing your online course participants and that it has been a real privilege to be able to facilitate those sessions and take part in the growth of those faculty members because you see teaching these quality matters courses and also taking them a real transition in the perspective of those participants about what quality means for the online course experience and influence that individual faculty can really have over that experience for individual students, even through minor changes that they can make in their course. Uh, it, yes, it's just such agree. an impact. I agree. Well, again, thank you to Brett as well and to Joy for providing the COLA and OCO updates. Uh, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce Chancellor Allison Garrett. Uh, who has joined us today live via Zoom and will be providing some remarks to kick us off for the con or a conference here. So Chancellor, it's so wonderful to have you here on the call this morning. I really appreciate your presence on the call and I know our audience does as well. So very much excited to hear from you and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Brad. And, um, and thank you to all of you. Um, you know, as I reflect back on the last couple of years and think about the swift transition that so many faculty who were, as, as one speaker just noted, uh, maybe unaccustomed to offering uh, courses online, it was a mammoth undertaking. And I, and I think in particular about some of the faculty at my university, and many of them, of course, were accomplished uh, in teaching online, but we also had a few who were still lecturing from crispy legal pads that were 30 years old and uh, for those individuals in particular, the sudden switch in the spring of 2020 to online instruction was just so very mammoth. And I know you all are doing so much to support other faculty at your institutions. And I, and I think about these last couple of years when so many courses uh, may have continued face-to-face, -face, but also had to be made available um, online because we had so many students who were going in and out of quarantine or isolation. And for many faculty, in addition, uh, they might've been trying to teach their own children at home uh, during portions of this time. And so thank you for everything you've done, uh, not only in your own teaching, but in support of other uh, faculty members. Brad knows that I like to uh, think about uh, maybe being on the bleeding edge of technology um, and um, you know, I'm always interested in what can be done, what is possible, and I know you all are doing so many things that, that I can only dream of. And I think about the way we do online education today, and I, I feel that in a few years we will look back on that in much the same way I look at a black and white television where I have to actually get up off of the couch to go flip a knob uh, to change the channel. Uh, because the 3D online education is starting uh, imminently. And at the university that I came from, we actually did a 3D marketing class several years ago just to prove that could be done. Uh, the only sad part of it was that the student projects that involved a local chocolate factory didn't involve taste and smell, 
um, in addition to the 3D viewing. But um, there is so much that can be done as we move forward. So thank you for uh, what you all are doing to really uh, be on the bleeding edge of things. As I think about the need for online education going forward, at the undergraduate level, while I think many of those students will still prefer to be almost entirely, if not entirely, face-to-face, -face, there will be, I think, some demand for courses that give those students some flexibility to pursue outside employment while they're in college. So an asynchronous uh, course that fills a schedule gap can be so very helpful for adult learners who, as you know, are about 40% or more of the population those asynchronous short-term courses, carousel approach can be incredibly important. And as we look at Oklahoma's uh, population of current or potential college students, we have in the state of Oklahoma today, 372,000 individuals who started college but did not complete. And so there's room, I think, to support them as well. And uh, Finally, I just want to say thank you for the work uh, that uh, you and others uh, in this space are doing to support OER, um, because that is something that can help move the needle in keeping the cost of attendance very affordable for our students. And I know at most of your institutions, you're probably starting with the gen eds because that's where you hit, hit the most students. And uh, so thank you for all of that work. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for everything you're doing and uh, for giving me just a moment to say hello. Chancellor, thank you again so much for joining us and for your remarks and your encouragement, honestly, of what we do as a profession within online learning and to serve our students. Uh, I think that every one of us feels the support of our leadership from across the state about, you know, how important this is for business continuity, to be honest with you, uh, for what we do for our students here. So thank you again very much for your time and for being thank here you. today. All right. Well, everyone, this actually does conclude the official session for the State of Online Learning in Oklahoma. So 